Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome, especially to our Ukrainian colleagues, wherever you may be. We're so pleased you're able to join us. Please select your language from the globe icon on your screen if you haven't already done so. As always, we are deeply appreciative of our interpreters. I hadn't realized, but when our Ukrainian colleagues speak, it's first translated into English and then from there into the other languages. It's really very impressive. And it's why everyone, including me, needs to speak very slowly. Also, just to let you all know that we have only one Chinese interpreter today, Angeline Liu, so she won't be in a relay. That's going to be very, very strenuous for her. So we may have to stop and take a quick break at some point. We'll see how it goes. But much appreciated, Angeline. Thank you. My name, for anyone who, who doesn't already know me, is Catherine Cox. I'm an analyst in London and I'm a member of the WUJ team. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's good to come together again. It's our fourth webinar. If this is your first time, welcome. If you are a regular participant, thank you for joining us again. It's nice to see you. Do feel free to put your name and where you're from in the chat if you would like to. So just to start with a big thank you to everyone who contributed images to the slideshow and to Alison Tuzo at Arras for putting it together. Such beautiful images and music reminding all of us, whatever tradition we come from, that rebirth and renewal follow death and destruction in a never ending cycle. Evil is being poured on Ukraine at the moment, but in that fire, depravity and suffering, something new, strong and special is being forged. We see it in our colleagues, even as they struggle. So Aris will be posting the slideshow on their website as a resource for everyone to use. So if you're feeling low, anxious, or suffering a bit of a freeze response, you might like to have another watch of the slideshow. I'm very pleased shortly to hand over to our chair for today, Alessandra de Montezemolo. Although Italian, Alessandra lives and works in Paris and is a training analyst with the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. Rather than list all of Alessandra's accomplishments when time is tight in these webinars, I'd rather give the voice to her. But I will just tell you that Alessandra has been involved in WUJ since the beginning. She's one of our social dreaming matrix conveners and facilitated one of the Lunalov reading groups. But what I love about Alessandra is her passion and her big heart. And on that note, I will give her the floor. Welcome, Alessandra. Thank you very much, Kathy, for your very warm welcome. And thank you and good evening and welcome to each one of you and all those joining the community tonight. First, we will repeat, please click on the world globe at the bottom of your screen uh, to make sure you choose the language for the simultaneous translation from Ukrainian, English, and you will find Spanish, French, Italian, Chinese, Chinese, um, German and Portuguese. Um, there is, if you don't find it on your screen, there's a little row of small dots and you may find it there. A very big thank you again, as always, to our team of interpreters who enable the wider international community to join us in supporting Ukraine. Just to let you know what will be happening in our webinar today, we will shortly be having our minute of silence. The chat is now open if you would like to name anyone for us to hold in mind during the silence. You're welcome to say a few words about them if you would like. Olena and Lionel Corbett will soon share their presentations. This will be followed by Q&A. The Q&A function will be open from the beginning of their talks. And if you wish, to ask a question yourself, please add an asterisk at the end of your written question. Questions may be put in English or Ukrainian. So before we turn to our speakers tonight, 
let, let us spend a minute together in silence to remember those who have died in the war, whether civilians or in battle, those who mourn, those who have been tortured, violated, injured, or abducted, all those who are under a constant threat of attack, those who are displaced and separated from family, and those who have lost their homes. We remember them all now. Many of you here with us tonight have been living for more than a year in a war you certainly didn't want. Let me state clearly once again that although we all hope that peace will win and overcome this horrible one-sided war, there can be no doubt about condemning the brutal Russian invasion. Ukrainians are bravely defending their land and their unique identity from their attackers' will for erasure. But we should always never forget that your people are also protecting one of the most precious values for all of us here, democracy. <clears throat> I am honored to join the significant webinar on Jung's notion of the self. As moderator, on this very special symbolic date for my country. April 25th is the National Liberation Day in Italy. On this precise day in 1945, my country recovered its freedom from the fascist regime and the Nazi occupation. My father was engaged in the Italian resistance and survived. My father's cousin, Giuseppe di Montezemolo, was tortured and killed by the Nazi invader on March 24, 1944, at the Fosse Ardatine in Rome, together with other 334 prisoners. It is very important to remember that freedom from oppression and tyranny is always possible, but it requires resistance, resilience, and immense courage. It was possible then, and it will be again and again in Ukraine and wherever people are fighting for their right to live in their own country and democracy. I will continue to engage side by side with our Ukrainian colleagues in our common and continuous quest for deep meaning and freedom in these thought defying times. As an introduction to our theme tonight, I would like to honor our colleagues with the words of a great German woman and philosopher that I have always recognized as having parallel deep and relevant reflections to those of C.G. Jung on self and evil. Quote, you are quite right. I changed my mind and do no longer speak of radical evil. It is indeed my opinion now that evil is never radical, that it is only extreme and that it possesses neither depth nor any demonic dimension. It can overgrow and lay waste the whole world precisely because it spreads like a fungus on the surface. It is thought defying 
as I said, because thought tries to reach some depth, to go to the roots. And the moment it concerns itself with evil, it is frustrated because there is nothing. That is its banality. Only the good has depth that can be radical. This is from a letter to Sholem in December 1964 by Anna Arendt. So tonight I have asked our two speakers to join me on the screen while I introduce them. So good evening to both of you. So Dr. Lionel Corbett is a medical doctor and a psychiatrist and a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. He is the author of six books, amongst which most are very significant for tonight's webinar. I will mention them. Psyche and the Sacred, the Religious Function of the Psyche, The Sacred Cauldron, Psychotherapy as a Spiritual Practice, The Soul in Anguish, Psychotherapeutic Approaches to Suffering, and Understanding Evil, a Guide for Psychotherapists. And last but not least, The God Image from Antiquity to Jung. Olena is a Jungian analyst, Vice President of the Ukrainian Union Association and former president of a professional association of child analytical psychologists, a member of the Ukrainian Development Group she likes to explore the intersection of analytical psychology and art. Olena comes from the Northern Black Sea region of Ukraine and loves the history of her land, which has always been a place of intersection of different cultures. So Olena, the floor is yours for the presentation tonight. Thank you, Alessandra, so much. Today, I'd like to start my presentation by saying that all of us tend to think about what God tells us and if he speaks. I have heard reflections about the God who is silent. I have heard reflections on that God is omnipresent and he is not present anywhere that he is silence and that he is a cry, that he lives in the depths of the sea and in the high sky. It seems that he is everywhere that human thought can reach. Humans think of God wherever human thoughts reach. There are people who shout about God and there are people who are silent about God. And I will dare assuming that each of us has at least once in our lives spoken to God, talked to God, and had this dialogue inside or outside. Fanatics and terrorists shout the loudest about God. God speaks to us through our beliefs and our religion. He speaks through the mouth of Christ to Christians. He speaks via Prophet Muhammad to Muslims. In James Morrow's book, The Only Begotten Daughter, God speaks to the main character through a sea sponge. God speaks through dreams and the unconscious to Jungians. But when God speaks to us through war, through deaths of our loved ones, through torture, can we assume that this is how he speaks? Or is he silent? Is he absent? And does that mean 
that he is obliged, he must speak to us. But does God's silence mean that he must be heard? Does it mean instead that he is absent? These are some of the few questions that I ask to myself and that my patients ask to themselves during the time that the war has been ongoing in the territory of our country. In one of his papers, Bernard Sartorius says that God is what gives meaning to our existence. The silence of God in itself evokes nostalgia about that there was a time when God spoke. There was a time when life had meaning. Let's try and imagine a prayer. Prayers fall into three categories. Prayers of request, prayers of thanksgiving, and prayers of praise. For example, we can imagine a prayer for peace, or a prayer for health, or a prayer for a cozy home, a prayer for children, a prayer for a happy family, prayer for food, prayer for water, prayer for deliverance from suffering, and many more different types of prayers. And these prayers will sound different from a soldier at war, from a person who lives in prosperity, from a person who needs a piece of bread. Depending on this, each of us will perceive the events that follow after the prayer as the fact that God heard us or not. And then I would like to ask the question, what kind of God are we praying to? I think that different prayers will be addressed to the God who answers and to the God who is silent. Now I want to turn to Plato's ethics. He wanted to help people understand the essence of the good life and help them live it. He called this life imitation of God. His idea was that man should improve and perfect his or her being. But improving this world, word, uh, Plato proposed to improve it by dividing it into the better and worse, that is into the shadow and light. In this theory, a human being is split into body and soul, and one needs more care and the other is put in a diminished position. Jung held the, to the idea that an individual is more than just repressed sexual drive, and that the human psyche consists of more than just one complex. Jung talks about importance of complexes, and he talks about them not as about parts of the human psyche that interfere, but as about one of parts of a human being. Jung suggested talking to one's wounds, looking for the possibility of dialogue with one's uh, shadow aspect. And it seems to me that this is one of the key aspects due to which psychoanalysis continues to develop today as a step away from the black and white perception from the ethics of the good and evil to the ethics that 
Neumann, uh, that Neumann later wrote about, and he spoke of it as the new Essex, and Erel Shalit called this Essex the Essex of the survivor. Neumann, Neumann was a Jew who was educated in Berlin and left for Tel Aviv uh, before the outbreak of the Second World War. He left at a time when many people could hardly imagine, even in their nightmares, what would happen in Europe further on. Or, in other words, he, uh, nobody could predict which way God would turn to us. We often do not want to think the worst of ourselves and our God. I think that in Israel, Neumann heard more than one story of a survivor. And this impacted, influenced him, and he wrote the book on New Essex. This book is about an ethic that differs from Judeo-Christian psychology. This is a story about Germans who not only became like beasts, animals, but also about those Germans who helped those who found themselves in Auschwitz or in other places filled with pain. A person who experiences a tragedy experiences in his or her own way. I would like to introduce you to pieces by an artist who had to flee from home in an emergency mode due to the outbreak of the full-scale war. This is a man aged 68. He was fleeing, living with his grandchildren, cat and dog. Most of them were shocked by the, what was happening. And he refers to the series of paintings, uh, uh, Train Kiev Lviv, Traveling to Nowhere. I saw in his works how a person loses human individual features and turns in uh, into a copy of other people who are penetrated with pain. And I thought about how was it possible to convey such heavy feelings and emotions. The person was there. He was an immediate direct participant of the events. The journey from Kiev to Lviv usually takes six to eight hours. That train traveled for three and a half days. Where four people are supposed to be placed, 15 people were squeezed into a regular slip, uh, slipper carriage. People slept on the floor in the corridors. In the uh, carriages wagons, uh, which are plans for 32 seats, there were 200, 220 people. When they arrived at the station, they were forbidden to leave the train until the morning because of the air raid alert. All those people had to sleep on the floor of the railway station. These drawings made me think that in a situation that is life-threatening, it is important for a person to merge, to unite with other people, to have a community that will share unbearable experiences with them. I asked myself the question, what is more important, to merge or to have that black and white thinking, or to preserve your unique, multifaceted and um, ambiguous way of thinking. And is it possible even in the time of a war? I can't say that I have found answers to this question, but I would like to share with you what I have arrived at so far. War, war narrows perception and makes it more literal. Therefore, when a person is traumatized, shocked, at first, of course, they need to be brought out of that shock. But what next? And how to bring back symbolic thinking? Symbolic thinking is what distinguishes us from animals. Sorry, these are 
more drawings by the man. These are his drawings. I want to I want you to see them. And these inscriptions were Kiev Lviv. These are inscriptions that he made on those drawings. This is the carriage where people were traveling. So symbolic thinking is what distinguishes us from animals. Animals and primitive man eat their food as soon as they get it. And only the modern cultured individual has the capacity to postpone the immediate fulfillment of their desire. In a sense, delayed gratification is part of human culture. A person can set the table for every event in a particular way. That is about finding symbols for different events in one's daily life. This implies a special human culture. With the development of the capacity to postpone gratification, pleasure, the person develops the capacity to create. And in such a way, the individual becomes a co-creator. Then crockery appears, dishes start being decorated with ornaments, and uh, for each event, people come up with symbols. And there are symbols for each culture. For Ukraine, a country of farmers, the symbols of uh, fertility of the earth are characteristic. While in other cultures, those will be symbols of wines or fishery. That is, it is with emergence of the culture that symbols and their differentiation appear. And thus, there are reasons to fight for your culture. We find ourselves in a vicious circle. Culture, on the one hand, helps us create symbols, and at the same time, it divides people. If you look at war from the point of view of physics, war is just a competition in throwing pieces of metal at human bodies. But we all understand that war is something more than pieces of metal, something more than physics, history, anatomy, and biology, more than a strategy handbook, and more than all sciences combined. War is an alloy of everything learned and unlearned. It is the most difficult exam trial for humanity. It is something that happens at all levels of life simultaneously. And there is a great temptation to link the war to time and to say to yourself or to people something like this. Here is the timeline. Here is the point at which the war began. And if there is a point at which the war began, then there must be a point at which the war will end. And everything will be as it was before, before this first point. However, it's not going to return. In a sense, no one comes back from war, even those who were in the rear. Because war is not only about getting a piece of metal into somebody's body and not letting the metal get into your body. War is about everything simultaneously. It is about metal in the body and metal in the eyes. War is transformation. And then we can say that this is also about God. My patient told me that she had seen letter X on a computer screen made of paper. And she said that it seemed to her that it was a taped window that was taped because of the risk of uh, bombing. And then she realized that it was just a letter, letter X.
war is above all an attack on thinking, a kind of breakdown into black and white. And here I would like to ask the following question. What comes first? Breakdown of thinking into black and white, or does war make thinking literal? In these times, is there intellectual freedom or freedom of thought? Maybe it is not just a necessity, but also a value. If we need complex senses, objective and multifaceted thinking during the war. It is clear that the war is scary. It is very scary. This fear forces us to go down to a lower level to cling to a warm shoulder of a person nearby, to be in a group of like-minded people. Group identity makes us deny our own complexity. Maybe we all have a duty to find our way to the symbol of God and to keep this complexity of perception. The current evil is not in our imagination the evil is right now in my country. A dream is always the realization of a desire, as Freud described it. What kind of God's desires are realized in a war? This is a cruel, a bloodthirsty God or a good God. Maybe at this moment we meet a God who wants to unite his different parts and wants to have a dialogue between the irreconcilable parts of the human psyche. The unconscious contains everything that the consciousness rejects. And the more Christian the consciousness is, the more pagan the unconscious behave, especially when the rejected paganism still contains viable values. That is when, along with water, the child is also thrown out, which is very often the case. The unconscious does not isolate and dismember its objects as the conscious does. So this is what Yun used to say. At this moment, uh, the transformation of God and the transformation of the self takes place. Yun writes that God has a shadow, but in order to accept this, we must face evil directly we must accept that this whole God has a shadow part. Our task is to transform the negative aspect of God through our personal story. Can there be a God without a negative part inside? Or can there be life without the certainty that we will die? In his answer to Job, Jung writes that God is unconscious, so he needs our consciousness. It seems that a person's prayer is transformed as they encounter different manifestations of God. I had a patient who told me a story. When she was a little girl, her mother brought her very beautiful trousers from Italy. The patient accidentally tore the trousers and she was afraid that her mother would scold her. She asked God with all of her might to mend her trousers, but God was silent and her mother punished her. She said, I couldn't be angry with God. That is why I was angry with my mother. Today, this patient knows how to mend a hole in her trousers. But now her loss looks different. This is the loss of a peaceful life, the loss of those values that used to be unshakable. A person gradually learns how to mend holes on the outside, and then he or she can pay attention to the fact that she has a, so a hole inside. It seems to me that this is one of the places where transformation takes place. We see a large set of different mental states, but each of these states expresses connectedness, pleasure, initial absence, and emptiness. 
Thus, we see that if God is comprehended as something that gives meaning, the preacher's idea of God, who can be literally heard, is inadequate to the reality around him. The concept of either or, God either speaks so is silent and absent, as if to cancel out the diverse experience of silence. Moreover, the very attempt to imagine the silence of God carries the risk of overestimating the concept that divides life into opposites. There is God or there is no God, external or internal, silence or sound, consciousness or unconsciousness, healthy or pathological, truth or falsehood. On the other hand, from a psychological point of view, the words God or gods can point to all possible expectations, which go back to the hope that life and death and human beings, starting with each of us, should somehow be somewhat different from what they are perceived to be in fact. The hope is that God's intrinsic meanings will enable us to transcend the experience of the here and now. The possibility that is hoped for can express itself in religious discourse because it can be called the self, an inner guide. Although Jung did not speak of it, he did not speak of the self in this sense, which may in fact coincide with the preacher's expectation that the answer to the question of the search for meaning has been, is, and should be. And if not, then perhaps there is an insufficiently well-built ego self-axis, or in religious terms, God does not speak at all or no longer speaks. But perhaps if we lower our expectations of God, the expectation of a just intervention, but at the same time, if we leave the duality and leave God as a symbol that can help us to transcend, what will happen then? I propose to go back to Mikola Sokolov drawings, and I want you to look at them not only from the point of view of emotions that they evoke, but also from the point of view of the dualistic discourse. Is God silent or not? Does the self speak from the depths of the unconscious or not? Well, first I propose you to pay attention to the title of this series of drawings, Piv Lviv Road. This is a road between the two cities, between two realities. If you pay attention uh, to this fashion, we see that there are concentric circles in the left, upper left hand side. These circles close in on themselves. It is very similar to a mandala. It seems that when drawing, a person is not looking for connections and minutes outside of himself, but rather tries to reconnect with himself. He is focused on himself. He focuses on himself. And this is what happens during a meditation and when drawing a mandala. This is where duality appears. The body moves, the psyche is focused and processes the experience. So we cannot talk about consciousness in the sense of wakefulness, but we cannot talk about the state of sleep. There is enough light, oh, enough to draw, but the drawings are only in black and white because the trauma does its work of splitting, dividing into the conscious and the unconscious, the understandable and the absurd. And then we can ask, is there a silent God or a speaking God? It seems that people have lost God, but they continue to search for him. They have lost a just 
God, but they have found a God to whom they can ask questions. And now I suggest that we do a little exercise. Imagine that you are these people in the picture who miraculously got into the carriage, who are silent, and each of them is thinking about God, about their own God, and each of them is with their own feelings and uh, different images. And now try to imagine yourself as God who is looking at these people. People are not looking at God. Everyone is in their own place. And we, the audience, we have the opportunity to see them all at the same time. What is happening to them? What happens to us if we are God? What happens to us when we look at them? At this very moment, the people sitting in this carriage are at the same time those who have lost their homes and those who have their homes, people whose valuables have been packed into one suitcase in a few minutes and whose valuables have remained in their homes. There are people who will return back home and those who will never return there. They are united by a common experience, and the artist shows this experience. They seem to turn into butterfly cocoons. There are no faces. No one is looking at each other. And there's only one cat which maintains contact with the one who is looking at her. You can see the cat in the lower left-hand side. So here you can also see a cat just in the middle of the picture. In his uh, book, Memories, Reflections and Dreams, Jung writes that no matter how severe the psychosis he was working with, he always felt that there was a healthy part of the psyche that was just looking on from the outside. In his later works, Jung would call this part of the self. The cat here represents the self. Which indicates that this connection is still there, deep inside, under the bench, in the shadow, in the lower part of the screen. People are silent. What are they silent about? Is it possible to speak in the presence of a God who is silent? What kind of God do people keep silent about? Maybe about the God who has manifested himself or is manifesting himself through actions. Maybe these people are united by a common carriage. Uh, they are experiencing these common events through personal perception. Each of them is now job, and no one has an answer to what has just happened. Let's take a look at the central couple sitting at the top shelf. They are a boy and a girl who were supposed to get married that day, but the war broke out. They are the bride and groom, and at the same time, they are the people who did not get to their wedding. So this is a bride who is going to get married. She uh, he has a traditional wedding bouquet. And here you can see a bride who was depicted by René Magritte at the painting The Great War, which dates back to 1964. So we see a woman in a wedding dress with a wedding bouquet. This bouquet consists of violets. At the very name of the violet flower, violet, Hints of the violence, that is war, which apparently has separated the lovers forever. 
Marguerite painted this work three years before his death, when he was an elderly man who had experienced the horrors of two world wars. Perhaps the artist expressed his grief for these events by metaphorically depicting a bride with a wedding bouquet, which she no longer needs. She's doomed to remain in a white wedding dress, alone on a pier, alone on a deserted sea. Have you noticed how our perception of symbols changes when they start to sound like traumatic experiences? This bouquet is no longer perceived as an ordinary bouquet, but as something that hides a face. What is on this face? Tears, laughter, surprise, fear? Is there a face? Is this woman alive? We have a lot of questions. Marguerite managed to depict this scene in such a way that we can hear its stunning silence. And this is also a symbol that points us to a different perception of reality, to the place where God's transformation takes place. In this very moment, we can encounter the properties of consciousness that provide an understanding beyond dualistic thinking. We become the God who speaks or to whom we can ask questions. This is an illustration of a worldview that is open to the reality of being. Because being alive in the here and now, on the other side of the imagination, can make a big difference. A war is something that destroys idealistic values. And to cope with this destruction, we return to duality, in particular to the duality of God. It symbolizes the dark side of the archetype of God. In part, God becomes a reality from which two angels emerge. One of these angels is sent by God to heaven and the other to the underworld. Symbolically, we can see a situation in which a difficult life experience and woundedness are not only requisites, but also directly contribute to transformation of consciousness. It seems that sometimes we try to find support in an external God or meaning, and then it can become too valuable. It can become so valuable that we start fighting for it. And then the symbol of God becomes split between religions, nations, countries. In moments like this, we need a quality of consciousness that can withstand the conflict of opposites. And this tension, consciousness tends to free itself from idealistic expectations, such as the expectation that God or the self should not be silent, or the expectation that God should intervene and restore justice. But if God is silent, does this mean that he doesn't exist? Do we cease to exist when we experience severe pain? Do we cease to be human? Perhaps we humans are here to remind God that love, acceptance, forgiveness, and faith exist in this world. Symbolically, it does not matter which methods are used by the ego. It is much more important that there is a potential possibility of processing life experience, which is necessary for the formation of the soul. Thank you so much for your attention. That's it from me. I will stop there. So thank you very much, Olena, and I leave the floor to Lionel um, for his uh, presentation.
what I'm going to talk about today is the idea that um, Jung's approach to the Western God image and to spirituality and religion in general is very often incompatible with traditional theism and incompatible with a great deal of traditional Christian and Jewish doctrine and dogma. And I'm going to suggest that, in effect, Jung's approach offers a, a kind of new myth of God. And I see this as an evolutionary step in our understanding of divinity. I also see Jung's approach as an alternative for people who've lost faith in traditional religions and traditional God images. So what I'd like to do now is outline some of the main differences between Jung's approach and traditional theism. First, um, Jung's notion of the self as an imago dei, as an image of the divine. Jung thinks that the psyche has an innate image of the divine. He calls it the self or the God within. And he thinks that the self is projected in all cultures onto whatever is the local name for God. So Christ or the Yahweh of the Hebrew Bible would only be two examples any local divinity could carry that projection. So in contrast to the traditional insistence that there's only one correct image of God, for Jung, any local divinity can carry this kind of projection. All the divinities of all religious pantheons and mythologies are actually projections of the self. Each one of them is colored by local historical and folkloric factors. So all, for Jung, all the gods and goddesses of all world mythologies and religions all originate in the objective psyche. They don't originate in some heavenly transcendent realm beyond the psyche. And Jung thinks that our task uh, is to withdraw these projections because now, as he says, it's not possible, this is a quote, it's not possible to maintain any non-psychological doctrine about the gods. Everything of a divine or demonic character, outsiders, must return to the psyche whence it apparently originated. He goes on to say it's a systematic blindness and a prejudice that God is outside man. So Jung's work reduces the need for conflict between competing monotheisms because the images of God all arise from the archetypal level of the psyche. So none of them could claim superiority. Now, very importantly, these intrapsychic images of the self may be entirely different than the manifestations of divinity described by the theistic traditions. For Jung, the content of the image is not important, and the content of a self-symbol may be completely unrelated to theological or biblical notions of divinity. The important uh, characteristic of an image of the self is not its content, but its emotional quality. These images are numinous, meaning they have tremendous emotional power. Classically, you remember from uh, Rudolf Otto, this, they were described as mysterious, tremendous, and fascinating producing feelings of awe and mystery and dread, the sense of uncanniness and so on. These images also suggest wholeness and completion, and they tend to unite opposites. Those are the characteristics, not the specific content. And the self and the archetypal level of the psyche is the source of all this kind of numinous imagery, because the unconscious has what Jung calls an authentic religious function that spontaneously produces this kind of material. These archetypal images of the self are also often related in some way to the dreamer's personal psychology. Sometimes they reflect traditional religious and mythological motifs, but sometimes they're completely original. They are only recognized by their emotional quality, by their numinous quality. So here are some examples of some self-symbols from dreams that are completely unrelated to traditional theistic god imagery, but which were very numinous for the dreamers. The first one is 
the dream in which an enormous unidentified flying object, a UFO, a huge thing, descends from, a, from the sky and hovers a short distance above the dreamer's head. That was very terrifying in its own right because of the size of this UFO. And then bright light shone down onto the dreamer. And as he looked up, he saw that the base of the UFO was studded with eyes and the light was shining down on him out of these eyes. Now for Jung, the mandala quality of the UFO is a very important self symbol and the numinosity and the awe that the image inspired in the dreamer are also characteristic. But obviously this image would not be accepted as a manifestation of the sacred or the holy by traditional religionists. But it would be by Jung because it was so numinous and because it has the mandala quality. And the image of being seen by the self was a compensation for the dreamer's long-standing sense of being unseen. So this is the kind of experience that makes the individual realize, as Jung put it, that the ego is the, is the object of a superordinate subject. In other words, something is aware of the ego, which radically relativizes the ego. Another example reported by Jung in a dream um, is a dream in which there's a, a star, which is like a bluish diamond in the sky. And the, the lovely bluish diamond star was reflected in a round, quiet pool on the earth, heaven above and heaven below. So the heavenly diamond is a self symbol, an imago dei reflected in the small pool, which obviously represents the individual psyche, reminding us of the old saying, as above, so below. But again, the diamond wouldn't necessarily be accepted uh, uh, as an image of the divine in traditional uh, theistic uh, imagery. Here's another mandala image in which the dreamer uh, sees an enormous, gigantic blue eye about three feet across. And she says, I felt penetrated by its gaze. I stood there in awe and fascination. There's the numinous quality of the dream. The contours of the eye became red, orange, and gold, and the eye came closer until I was only aware of the iris, and the iris became square, then round, then square again, continuing to change from square to round. And then the eye seemed like a huge window or door, and beyond it, the dreamer could see a world of light, and she says, I could enter into that world. I was excited by the landscape, but also frightened by the sense of infinity, boundlessness, and eternity that I saw. The light beyond the door was unlike any light I've ever seen. It was silvery and cold and warm and soft and colorless. She says, I felt as though I was falling into it. Again, nothing specific, uh, nothing traditionally uh, um, common to any of the, the, the traditional theistic images of God, but very numinous for the dreamer. I have a couple more um, very surprising self symbols that I've taken from the literature. Here's a dream in which a figure approaches the dreamer. He's a crippled beggar with only half a body rolling on a kind of skateboard. I greet him, he informs me that he is God. Surprised but not astonished, I nod and offer him a drink at a kiosk at the side of the bridge. He accepts and now has a full body, rather large. We drink wine in a mutual toast. He holds his hands over mine and there pours from his fingers onto my palms a great number of gold and silver coins from every nation and every time. Here's another unusual God image. I'm informed that God, is, in a dream, I'm informed that God is a great worm whose body constitutes the matter of the entire universe. All the galaxies are his organs and all the living forms are cells within these organs. The worm doubles back on itself, head to tail, like a Euroborus and undergo, undergoes a vast pattern of inhalation and exhalation. 
those creatures fortunate enough to be located at the regions of the body where this breathing occurs can have mystical experience. So here we have the self symbol, uh, um, the self as a diamond, an eye, a great worm, or a crippled beggar with half a body. Obviously, these would not be accepted as manifestations of the divine by traditional theists who advocated transcendent divinity. But each of these images was tremendously numinous and emotionally powerful for the dreamer. So for Jung, they are manifestations of the self, at least partial manifestations of the self. And whether such images of the self refer to a transcendent divinity beyond the psyche, we cannot decide, Jung believes, because if there were such a divinity, Jung points out, we could only experience it by means of the psyche. We can't get out of the psyche. Jung thinks that there is what he calls an original beyond the images, something the images point to. But the original is not accessible to us except by means of the psyche in this kind of symbolic form. It may be that the objective psyche itself generates images of the self, or perhaps the unconscious is only the medium of transmission of a divinity beyond the psyche. In other words, we don't know if the objective psyche is actually synonymous with divinity, according to Jung, but he implies that this might be true. In memories, uh, he, he says the following, this is a quote, I prefer the term the unconscious, knowing that I might equally speak of God or daimon if I wish to express myself in mythic language. When I do use such mythic language, I am aware that mana or daimon and God are synonyms for the unconscious. That is to say, we know just as much or just as little about them as about the latter. Now, Jung is often criticized for spiritualizing the unconscious by psychologists uh, like uh, Eric Fromm did that and the Freudian tradition did that and also by theologians. But he's just using the term unconscious to mean the unknowable. But for most Jungians, the unconscious is synonymous with the spiritual dimension. He thinks that the experience of the self, quote, constitutes the most immediate experience of the divine, which is psychologically possible to imagine. And the fact that the archetypal level of the psyche spontaneously generates images of the self explains why human beings have always had a sense of the presence of divinity. This means that religion is inevitable. The self is a priori. It's not introjected, not learned, and it's not simply an invention of the human mind. So again, whereas traditional theism imagines the divine in a heavenly transcendent realm, Jung sees the gods and goddesses of all the world's traditions as arising from the archetypal psyche. So what is thought to be an experience of transcendence is actually for him an experience of the non-ego levels of the psyche. All numinous and mystical experience arise from this level, which is perhaps what Jesus meant by saying that the kingdom of God is within you. So for Jung, the divine is not so much out there as it is deeply within our own subjectivity. The radical imminence of the self within the psyche is not really compatible with the classical Thomistic Christian image of a self-sufficient, objective, transcendent divinity who intervenes in our lives from a heavenly realm. And in the tradition, this divinity's grace towards humanity has to be mediated by the church. Now, it's true that the imminence of the divine is recognized in all traditional theisms. For example, in St. Paul's comment, Christ who lives in me, in Galatians. But for Jung, the range of God images in the psyche is much greater than the traditions would allow. We don't know whether the intrapsychic images of the self and the transcendent God of the theisms are indistinguishable or not. Jung thinks that in practice they appear to be. 
he wouldn't commit himself in his technical writings on this point because he wanted to retain the appearance of being an empiricist. But privately, he seems to have believed that the self is a manifestation of the divine in the traditional sense. That's certainly my view, and it's the view adopted by many religion, many Jungians with a religious orientation. But Jung thought that we couldn't infer analogies between the qualities of an intrapsychic image of the self and the transcendent God of the theisms. We don't know the relationship of the self to its unknowable metaphysical background. I think that images of the self are describing what the Upanishadic tradition refers to as Saguna Brahman, or Ishvara, the divine experienced, uh, possessed with particular qualities. But Jung does occasionally point out similarities between his notion of the self and the god of theism. For example, when he talks about the self as having an incorruptible or eternal character that's pre-existent to consciousness. But he does say that the existence of an intrapsychic god image and numinous imagery does not prove the existence of the metaphysical god of the theisms. But these kinds of images are the most we can say about God psychologically. And he insisted that personal experience of the numinosum are much more important than belief in doctrine and dogma. He thought that belief requires the suppression of doubt, which is always lurking in the background of belief. But when you've had an important numinous experience, you don't need belief. The experience becomes knowledge. So in his model, there's no need for adherence to creedal statements of faith of the kind that several religions demand of their adherence. And his approach doesn't require a hierarchy, a priesthood, or a sacred text, or a historical institution, or a covenant, or belief in mythic biblical stories as if they were literal history. Another important difference is that Jung thought that revelation is continuous. So novel experiences of the self are actually forms of revelation, which is not restricted to the Judeo-Christian revelation at Mount Sinai or in Christ. Traditional religionists don't like this idea that there could be private forms of revelation because the imagery that arises from the objective psyche often doesn't conform to traditional doctrine and dogma. The enormous range of self-symbols may uh, disconfirm official church teaching, as Jung pointed out in his essay on Nicholas of Louis. So Jung says, we can't Christianize the unconscious. It may produce imagery from any religious or mythological system, and it has no regard for the subject's personal religion. So, for, for example, a Jewish man, a, a physician with no conscious connection to Christianity or to Christ, had this dream. I'm the ship's doctor in a Roman galleon. Jesus is carried in. He's just been crucified. He's still nailed to the cross. The ship's captain tells me, I'm, since I'm the ship's doctor, I should examine him to see if he's dead or not. As I approach him, the figure on the cross rises into the air, becomes the size of a small wall crucifix, and suddenly rushes into me and penetrates my heart. This is a very good example of how the psyche's innate religious function is not interested in denominational differences. So a modern-day Christian or Jew may dream of a Hindu or ancient Egyptian god or goddess. Um, I've reported in, uh, in another context the dream of a Roman Catholic priest who had a numinous vision of the pre-Christian Venus of Willendorf, an early goddess or great mother symbol. Jung's childhood vision of a turd falling from the throne of God onto the roof of the Basel Cathedral is a further example of a numinous experience that is shockingly antithetical to traditional Christian imagery. And we can also recall his numinous vision of Christ on the cross uh, when he was giving the seminar on the Ignatian spiritual exercises. He says the vision was not quite life-size, but very distinct, 
and the body was made of greenish gold. The vision was marvelously beautiful, and yet I was profoundly shaken by it. And he saw this vision as an alchemical conception of Christ, as the union of spiritual, spiritually alive and physically dead matter, expressing the alchemical idea that there's a spirit, gold, in matter, green, in contrast to traditional Christianity's understanding of matter as inert and soulless. soulless. So he thought that Christianity had split matter and spirit, but this vision symbolically unites them. This is an example of how Jung is reinterpreting or re-mythologizing traditional Christian imagery. He understands the, the cross and the symbol of the crucifixion as a symbol of the tree of life or nature from which Christ had been separated and with which he ought to be connected again. So the tree being pinned to the tree brings back what was lost through Christ's extreme spiritualization, the, the element of the physical world. So that he saw the symbol of Christ on the cross as a symbol of the union of humanity with our vegetative or unconscious life. So for this kind of reason, Jung is often accused of straying out of psychology into theology, and he's often accused of psychologism reducing the transcendent divine to nothing but an intrapsychic phenomenon, as if divinity has no independent ontological status outside the psyche. This became important in his debates with theologians like Martin Buber. But Jung insisted that because the psyche is real, images of the self are images of something real, and they cannot be dismissed as simply epiphenomena of the brain's activity. And one of the great um, values of Jung's discovery of the self is that it avoids discussing the divine using anthropomorphic imagery of the kind uh, common in the Bible and the liturgy. For example, talking about God as a divine father or king or shepherd. Instead, the kind of numinous material that I've talked about gives the individual a unique and personal symbol rather than a collective symbol, such as the cross. Another very controversial idea of Jung is his notion of the relativity of the God image. In answer to Job, he writes that human consciousness is necessary for the divine to differentiate itself. And he thought that as the God image evolves within human consciousness, it uses the ego as a reflecting consciousness that allows the self to differentiate the opposites within its own nature. In other words, the self's need for a reflecting consciousness means that humanity and God are mutually dependent. There is a reciprocal relationship between them. John Dowley referred, this, referred, this, um, referred to this as a process of mutual redemption of the human and the divine very different God image than the traditional notion in which the divine and human are radically different. Um, I think I'll now move to one of the most important differences between Jung and traditional theisms, which is Jung's notion of the dark side of the self. And this is, of course, particularly important to the situation in, in Ukraine. His idea was that our image of the divine has to include a dark side. In the biblical book of Job, Yahweh allows Job to suffer terribly for no apparent reason. So Job experienced the dark side of divinity that causes suffering and evil. Many characters in the Hebrew Bible experience divine savagery and ruthlessness. And their experience is a mythic paradigm for the human experience of the dark side of the self. So Jung thought that the notion of the God as the summum bonum, the ultimate good, can no longer be maintained. It would be an act of denial. God is a paradox that represents all the qualities of creation, including positive and negative qualities. So our image of the divine has to contain all the opposites, including justice and injustice, good and evil, because the self is the totality of the psyche. 
So he's emphasizing the difference between our experience of the self, which has a dark side, and traditional Christian doctrine in which Christ is only good and evil is split off and projected onto the Antichrist or, or Satan. The ego experiences the dark side of the self or the archetypal shadow as destruction, chaos, physical and mental suffering and synchronicities with de devastating results. So Jung is objecting to the Augustinian notion that evil is the privation or the absence of goodness. For Jung, evil is much more than just an absence. Archetypal evil, the dark side of the self, cannot be integrated or treated in the usual therapeutic sense. It can only be held at bay or coped with. And here I'm talking about events like the war in Ukraine or events like the Holocaust. These are examples of human evil, but they also raise major questions about the relationship between evil and the divine. And this kind of question, of course, is not new. Recently, there was an earthquake in Tur Turkey and Syria, which um, again um, raised the question that was raised by the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, which also killed tens of thousands of people and forced a radical rethinking of the problem of evil in relation to the divine. In our era, we have the war in Ukraine, we have the Holocaust. These are the kinds of events that force us to the realization that we need a new God image, an all good God image can no longer be sustained. The question, where was God at Auschwitz, has never been and cannot be satisfactorily answered. And this is where Jung's notion of the dark side of the self becomes very important. If Jung is correct that the self has a dark side, then evil is more than purely human. A major drawback of this notion of the dark side of the self is that it mythologizes evil and it reduces our ability to understand it. If we have to contend with a God image that includes evil, that has very important moral implications. It would undermine morality if, if the wish to align with the divine means we can align with its dark side. That would legitimize evil. Also, we don't know what aspects of scripture or which commandments were given by the dark side of the divine. So this notion of the dark side of the self leaves open the question of God's total righteousness, which is so central to the monotheistic traditions. They would have to re radically reevaluate their theology and their liturgy that insists on the exclusive goodness of God. And the notion of the dark side of God has other implications, for example, in relation to the notion of a Trinitarian God. You remember that Jung thought that the unconscious uses the quaternity, an image with a fourfold structure, as the best symbol of wholeness. So he tends to see the Christian trinity as an imperfect symbol of wholeness. He, he wanted to add either the dark side of the self to the trinity or the feminine aspects um, of the divine to the trinity. So he, if he, he couldn't add both and preserve a quaternary structure. He never could decide which of those he wanted to add. This notion of the dark side of the self is very controversial, but it's consonant with many mythologies that describe opposing light and dark divinities. Think of Set and Osiris in Egyptian mythology, Loki and Baldur in Norse mythology, Ariman and Ahura Mazda in Zoroastrian tradition, and the dark side of God is well known in the Hebrew Bible. Amos says that evil does not befall a city unless the Lord wills it. Proverbs says that God has made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. And Isaiah says that God makes both peace and creates evil. And Jeremiah says that God's judgment will take the form of war, famine, and pestilence. Um, and defeat in battle reflects the wrath of God, and so on and so on. But this idea of the dark side of God is antithetical to most traditional Christianity, which insists that God is only good and loving. 
like uh, the first letter of John, which says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. By and large, in Christian doctrine, evil is seen as a corruption of creation or the result of the misuse of free will. Evil is not seen as the effect of God's power. So I think Jung's notion of the dark side of the self is largely incompatible with the Christian image of an all-good God and with the Christian view of evil. And I think that in the face of the scale of the evil and suffering that we're seeing all around us, maintaining an all-good God image just seems like a monumental act of denial. Um, now, the, the notion that the divine has a dark side that's responsible for suffering and evil is frightening. Um, if there is an archetypal shadow or the dark side of the self, it's not clear whether we, we could affect it. If Neumann's concept of the ego self axis is correct, we might be able to develop a relation, a relationship to it, or by becoming conscious of the personal shadow, we might be able to redeem a fragment of the transpersonal shadow that incarnates within the individual personality. But that's a metaphysical proposition. What matters in practice is whether we can contain and relate to the dark side of the self. The, the numinous energies involved are enormously powerful, and um, identification with the self or possession by the dark side of the self leads to great evil. This kind of inflation is very dangerous. We see it among all the historical and contemporary de demagogues who are malignant narcissists. This kind of feeling of being very special is either due to untempered infantile grandiosity or it's a defense against childhood um, experiences of being hated or envy. Grandiosity may arise as a defense against narcissistic vulnerability and shame produced by relational traumas in childhood, leading to severe narcissistic pathology. And these kinds of grandiose characters often commit evil. From an archetypal point of view, these dynamics allow the incarnation of the dark side of the self into the empirical personality in, in the form of the human shadow and dangerous complexes. The important implication of this process is that archetypal evil cannot be fully realized without the complicity of human evil and only the human moral sense and consciousness of the shadow stand in its way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel. And thank you, Olena. Um, I would like to invite everyone. Um, there were very dense presentation, both Lionel and uh, uh, Olena. Uh, to ask questions, you can ask questions in writing in the Q&A uh, box, or you can uh, go uh, at the bottom and where you find the, um, the, the little face, you can find a hand raise if you want to um, ask a question live. So I um, invite uh, whoever wishes to you know, ask questions to Alina, Olena or Lionel. Uh, this is the time. Yes. Tia, I'll... Um, yeah. Have I unmuted? Yes, you're, yeah. you're fine now. This is a question for Lionel. Oh, it's a pondering. Um, I found myself grappling with the ferocious energies of darkness and light, um, you know, the shadow side of God and the light side of God. And then I found myself thinking of the seventh sermon to the dead, where there seems to be Abraxas, which seems to encapsulate these dark and light energies that are ferociously numinous. And yet beyond it, he says, 
to this one star man shall pray. And I wonder whether there is a level where these things are left behind. I mean, one's talking impossible transcendent realities that you can't know without dying, I think. But have does that make sense, what I've said? I'm not sure what you mean by left behind, actually. Oh, I suppose I've read quite a lot about near-death experiences. And it seems to me that people enter a different realm um, when they leave this world and when you step off time. Wouldn't it be fair to say that the, the spirits came to Jung saying they, they couldn't find what they were oh, looking yes. for in the Judeo-Christian tradition? Yes, absolutely. So um, they've handed over to the living yes. the problem of dealing with the, the kind of difficulties that they couldn't solve in their lifetime. And we now have to work on their unanswered questions, that, that our ancestors' difficulties are something that we still struggle with. Oh, absolutely. And it's the last sermon to the dead that seems to point at something beyond that, um, which in itself is an incredibly numinous self-image, that star, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add about that. Other questions to Olena or to Lionel? Yes, Tara, please, I will activate. Here you go. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, such a moving presentation. Um, Lionel, I had a, a pondering myself about um, <clears throat> if there might be some connection or, or something to be said about the chthonic realm and the dark side of the self or the dark side of God. Um, I have in my own active imaginations and it encounters I have experienced the chthonic realm as a deeply numinous and in, ineffable <laughs> and very connected to uh, the mythos and symbols that I find there, especially in my own ancestral line, I've met some. Uh, I wonder if you can share anything I couldn't help but wonder and, and remember about some of those experiences as you, you were talking. Well, um, I think that that perhaps is why alchemy is very important, because the, the thonic realm refers to the depth of the material world, the depth of matter. And the alchemists realized that there was spirit in matter. So that when we go into the body or matter, we we do find the numinous. That's why Jung thought that the spirit mercurius for alchemy was very important, because it was a compensation or the um, Christian over-spiritualization. Um, Mercurius represents the spirit in matter or the, the spirit of the unconscious. I, I don't know if that addresses your question properly. We have uh, Heron. We have a couple of more questions. Uh, here we go. Wait, I have to, yeah. Yes, I'm, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, both of you. Lionel, if I can call you that, you know, you spoke so eloquently to something I have been struggling with all my life because um, as a Roman Catholic from Austria, I lost faith with uh, religion and when I was seven years old. And then I just bumbled through till I found um, astrology, would you believe it? Do you know the mandala of astrology? Then I read Jung, the answer to Joe, and suddenly everything fell into place for me as a personal experience where you have to learn in your individual self 
to deal with Saturn, your shadow, your squares, your Plutos internally. And, and I think that is a little bit what Jung said, if we all deal with our own little shadows, you know, it will affect a larger community, like a spiral effect. And I've seen it um, over the years being activated in this manner. And, you know, I had a friend, a very Catholic friend from Ireland, and when I told her that um, I'm reading Jung, this book, The Answer to Job, and, and I said, you know, God has a shadow. And she said, get away from me, you devil. <laughs> and Go behind me. And, uh, it, you know, it is a very difficult subject to talk on that level. Thank you. Thank you. It is difficult. Thank you for that. But it would be an act of denial to ignore it, I think. We have to find a way to come to terms with it. So I see several hands raised, but I also would like to read um, not a question, but a comment for Olena. Um, the, the comment is, Olena, the depth and profound gift of your work and the sacrifices and courage and tenacity of your people moves me with gratitude and a prayer for increase of consciousness in individual and collective life. And I, I just wanted to add, Olena, that the images of the, of the artist you showed are really live images of of, of transformation and of, of the of, of of what you were talking about, and were really very very impressive. Um, but I would like to give now. Uh, Neil has his hand up, and I will uh, unactivate the the sound for him to ask a question. Wait a minute, I have to, okay. Why isn't the sound working here? Here it goes. No. We don't We can hear you. No, we can hear you. We can hear you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, please go ahead. We can't hear you. We, we can. Oh, yeah. We can. Alessandra, are you in the right channel? Yeah. Excuse yeah. me. You're right. He thought that the self is the totality of consciousness and the unconscious, so it contains all the opposites within it, but they are in an undivided state. So in order for them to differentiate, the, in order for the opposites to differentiate into good and evil, light and dark, and so on, it, it requires a reflecting human consciousness for these, so that we be, become what he calls a vessel full of divine conflicts where we suffer the tension of the opposites. Uh, that, that's essentially his thesis in answer to Job.
um, the, the opposites that we struggle with uh, are, are um, originally part of the totality of the self. They differentiate within. We struggle with them and we try to come up with some kind of resolution. That, that I think that was his idea about that. The, the business of mutual redemption is very difficult. It, it may mean that if we if if you work on your own shadow material that that has a redemptive effect on on some aspect of the archetypal shadow but that's really where jung becomes metaphysical while he says he doesn't but it does it in several places but i don't know how to show that thank you we have shayla let me try and unmute you. Um, yes, thank you. This is for Elena. Um, I just thank you for the for the artist sharing the drawings and you bringing them to us. Um, it's, I'm an art therapist, and and so looking at that, the the concentric drawing is. I often will have someone with great trauma do concentric because the that movement is very soothing to the body and 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 the artist brought it all together in both having the individual images in individuals and yet the connection between them um and so i thought i think these are amazingly whole images as chaotic as they may appear that that his psyche is really struggling to bring him bring it all together in one so thank you thank you so much shayla for your commentary so this is really you are right when a person is into art he or she can through this art somehow create individual symbols thank you so much We have a written question. Um, is the self an archetype or that which consists of all archetypes or both? Is that for me or for Alina? It doesn't say for whom it is. So the one, whoever. Well, the, the, the self is the totality of the psyche. It's one of the paradoxes that it's the totality and also the center. So it manifests itself in specific symbolic forms, but none of those symbols is the self itself. They, each symbol of the self is just one aspect of a larger totality, but it's an ocean with no shore. It can't be symbolized in its totality. You can only see small aspects of it. One last comment. Um, thank you both for your engaging presentation. Lionel, I think you are effectively saying that our images of divinity are projections from the psyche, which comprises both good and evil. Okay. So, um, I think there's no more hands right risen. So we're coming to an end of uh, today's webinar. Um, just a uh, short information before we start um, with the, the, the prayer, the conclusion prayer. All the speakers and the support team offer their expertise free of charge to help raise money for our Ukrainian colleagues. So. Many of our Ukrainian colleagues are working free of charge and are unable to earn a living. They really need our help. Um, we um, would like to give each person 500 euros, but we would need to raise 24,000 euros. So far, we, we've been very successful and raised nearly 11,000 euros and 10,000 pounds. But we do ask everyone to contribute generously what is possible for you. And obviously, it's fine to give 
what we suggest, but also more or less if it's impossible to reach that amount. And if you have not already made a donation uh, for this webinar, whether you are listening live or you will be listening recording, please do go to the GoFundMe page. The link is on all the flyers. So thank you everyone for your generosity on behalf of all the Ukrainian unions team. And I'll hand it over to Kathy for the last remarks. And thank you so much to Lionel and to uh, Olena for these so deep uh, presentations. Yes, um, thank you, Lionel and Elena. They were fabulous and very thought provoking. And I'm still thinking about my own response to this um, very challenging talk. And thank you, Alessandra, for being such a wonderful chair and for all that you contribute to the WUJ project. Also, a very big thank you, as always, to the WUJ team, especially Claire Musho, Jackie Fisher, and Sally Arthur for the huge amount of work that you put in behind the scenes and without whom these webinars would certainly not be possible. Thank you also to the analyst in the United States who has sponsored this webinar and to Sanctus Media, Wordly Wise and Aras for their invaluable ongoing support and sponsorship. And I'll just quickly thank the interpreters once again. And if Angeline is still alive out there somewhere, well done, because that was a bit of a marathon for one person to do. So next month, our solidarity, solidarity gathering um, is going to have a slightly different format. It's a little bit of a mystery. Um, I'm not quite sure what's going to be happening. The title is Answer to Evil which is, of course, a riff on Jung's answer to Job. And it continues the theme that we've been exploring today. The topic just could not be more relevant. But quite what Murray Stein, Serhi Tekliuk, and Diane Stanley are planning is somewhat intriguing. I know it requires a rehearsal. It involves music. There's something to do with active imagination. And I don't really know any more than that. So um, if you would like to find out more, then please do come along on Tuesday, the 16th of May at our usual time, six o'clock London time, BST. So do come and support our Ukrainian colleagues and also all those who are under threat of erasure at this time. I can't really emphasize enough how much of a difference your presence really does make. And finally, we invite you to stay for a moment longer to join us as we play a powerfully stirring version of Lysenko's prayer for Ukraine. Our prayer for you, our Ukrainian colleagues, and anyone who's at threat, under threat at the moment, is that you, your friends and family, will stay safe until we meet again, and that you will continue to find strength and hope in the days ahead. We will hold you in our thoughts and prayers as always. Thank you.